Okay, you guys ready to go? We are back to square one. Are you, are you guys ready to go? All right. Um, let me, let me uh, show you something that I, I, I was really excited to hear about. I was an air traffic controller for 24 and a half years, and so uh, it was really, you know, I, I'm interested in planes. And hey, Have you guys ever heard of the F-117? The stealth, you've heard of it? There's a place in Arizona where they, uh, uh, all the old airplanes will go there. They call it like an airplane graveyard. And so they finally got the first F-117 in the graveyard in Arizona. I got a picture of it because it's a pretty cool airplane. And so... <laughs> Get it? Stealth? Can't. It's no good if I got to explain it. I mean, <laughs> um, this is this is my passion talk. So uh, I, I just found out. I was talking to a couple of gentlemen, and they told me that I did this the last time I was here two years ago. So I apologize to those of you that were here because I could have very easily done another talk. But I call it Evangelism 101: Ten Things a Christian Can Learn on Evangelism from an Atheist. And so. Uh, and I'll get into it uh, just a little bit. One book that I've got back there is The Reasons for Hope in the Mosaic of Your Life. I just, I share that with you because in there what I've done is I've shared some stories from my life because Body of Christ, this is evangelism. I think real evangelism is being out and open and sharing the broken pieces in your life. And what I mean by that is I got intrigued when I was in Jerusalem. Mosaics. I love mosaics now. Went to Jordan, an amazing mosaics. One town in uh, Israel that I went through this town, the whole road, the whole highway through the whole city was a mosaic. And I'm not talking just random. I th it was beautifully laid out. Well, I was in Jerusalem walking around and I came around a corner and there was this big wall and I was like three foot from this big wall and it was a big mosaic. And to be honest with you, when you're standing three foot from a big wall that's a mosaic, it's pretty ugly. It's just broken rock. So what I did is I backed up and when I got like 15 foot from the wall and I saw the whole thing, it was like, that's amazing. And that's when it hit me, that's our lives. I mean, sitting in this room tonight, I'm telling you, there are folks in here that have got broken pieces in their lives. And when we understand why we've gone through those things, not because God wanted us to go through those things, but because sin has destroyed the world that God gave us, which is what he wanted, which was perfection, we destroyed it. Um, God will take those broken pieces and arrange them in an amazing pattern if I will give them to him. Romans 5, 3, and 4 is a verse that I hang on to. Uh, so I, I share some of my broken pieces from my life. Because by doing that and pointing to Jesus, you can offer hope to people. And so that's all that is. I want to encourage you guys to offer hope to people. Share your stories. We don't need plastic. We don't need perfect. We need people who are real. And that's going to connect with this culture. Uh, our website is our F O R h.com r-f-o-r-h.com if you want to check out our website we've got a brand new one coming up i'm working on that you see me sitting around on my computer i'm not just emailing and messing around i'm actually working because we got a new website and we got the new dvd that i'm working on so uh take advantage of that here's i'm going to show a short video here because this is what i want to do with this talk Time to get that multitasking, 100 billion neuron connecting, priority arranging segment of your wonderfully constructed brain to contemplate this. Ever wonder how many handshakes take place in a day, how many hugs happen, how many one-to-one face-to-face -one -face conversations go on? What about glances, kisses, laughs, and prayers, ways we connect? And you, right there, right now, how are you connected to the person next to you, the people around you, your friends, your enemies, the strange dude at the mall? How about the movies you watch, the books you read, the messages all around you? And how do you connect differently than people connected in the past? So many thoughts, ideas, blogs, texts, posts, and tweets these days. Everybody wants to connect to someone or something. And the world wide web of intersection and connection has changed everything. Get this. One out of eight couples married in the U.S. in 2008 met through social media. Unfortunately, half will be divorced in five years, connected and disconnected. There are over 500 million active Facebook users who spend over 700 billion minutes per month clicking, posting, uploading, and downloading. An average user is connected to 80 community pages, groups, and events, and each person creates 90 pieces of content each month. Folks got a lot to share, a lot to say. So much that the average user spends 55 minutes per day, 6.5 hours per week, or about 1.3 full days per month on Facebook. 
And that's just people sitting around home because more than 200 million are on Facebook through mobile phones nowadays because long lost are the days of landline phones, busy tones, and yeah, Davy Jones. And speaking of cell phones, in 2004, 674 million were sold, which is 105 million less than the 779 million sold in 2005, which is nothing compared to the almost 4 billion sold in the last three years. Some people in the world who don't have toilets or houses have cell phones. People really want to connect. But wait, there's more. One trillion text messages were sent in 2008, 1.5 trillion in 2009, and then it went up to 6.1 trillion just recently. That's a thousand texts per person for every person on the planet. That's a lot of connecting. Yet this hasn't even scratched the surface. There's over 50 million tweets per day, over 60 million LinkedIn people, and 43 million people still visit MySpace per month. Then there's however many millions on Ning, Tag, Meetup, Bebo, My Yearbook, and Friendster looking at everything from posts to pics to video. Speaking of which, it would take you over 27 years without sleeping to watch all the videos uploaded on YouTube just this week. Everybody wants to connect. Connect with a friend, connect with family, connect to the past, connect to the future, connect to God. Con hmm. Connect with God. The one who created connections, voices, images, ears, eyes, smiles, kisses, glances, faces, friends, music, color, stars, electricity, light, laughter, and love, just to name a few. Connect with him? And what does that mean? Well, you connect the dots. <laughs> I don't know, are there any teachers in here, you know, like even home teachers or home studies or Sunday school teachers? These videos, um, I've created a page on YouTube, 27 years to watch all the videos just uploaded this week. Well, I add to that. I've got a premium page called Reasons for Hope Premium. If you go to YouTube and type it in, there's 44 videos like this one that you just saw, plus all the debunk, plus a number of my talks, and we're adding more all the time. And it's $20 a year. So I'm not trying to rip you off here, all right? 20 bucks a year, seriously, for 44 videos plus more being added. Because I wanted, I wanted people to have tools, but I got to try to generate revenue to make new tools, okay? And so uh, they're there. Take advantage of that. Reasons for Hope Premium on YouTube. And uh, don't forget to download the app. It's free of charge. I've, I've kept forgetting. I, all our cards are gone. Praise God for that. Just go to your uh, YouTube uh, or your uh, app store and type in Reasons for Hope. Reasons for Hope. If you've got a smartphone, do it now. Reasons for Hope. Download it. It's free of charge charge okay uh, if you're not on our mailing list sign up pray for us I don't beg for money um, we don't send snail mail a lot all I do are I send out email updates to keep you up to date and here's another tool this is for every parent especially if you use an iPad or an iPhone I don't know if it works on the Android I don't know um, I'm trying to make it work on the Android but I know that it works on the iPhone and the iPad if you go to your iTunes bookstore, all right? Go to your iTunes bookstore, type in Reasons for Hope, that's the ministry name, and then look for 226, that's for Proverbs 226. Train up a child in the way they should go, all right? This is a, stu a study, there's 20 interactive lessons. I designed these a number of years ago with the concept of parents sit down with your child, show a short video like Connect, like a debunked three to five minute video, have a 10 to 15 minute conversation with your child because the world is talking to them. They'll watch a three to five minute video like that. They'll watch that and then you get a conversation going. There's four parts to this because when I had it all in one, it was like 1.2 gigabyte. Way too big to try and download. <laughs> so I had to break it up into four sections of five so you get one week. You got one month of study. There's over 100 and, and this, is not, this is not marketing. There's $120,000 plus invested in this, and I'm giving it away free. And there's no twist. I don't even get your name when you go to the iTunes bookstore and download it. It's not like I'm going to get your name and address. I get nothing. But I want parents to have tools to talk with their children. So please take advantage of that. I've not talked about that, and I have to talk about it there. So here we go. Acts 18.9 That's where we're going to start. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. I've got to say to you that I believe that God is still talking to us, and I think he's still saying the same thing that he said to Paul. He is telling you and I, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. Let's set this in context, okay? Where was Paul headed? Paul was headed to a tough place. He was headed to Corinth. 
And God told him as he's on his way into a very tough place, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. Why? For I am with you. I genuinely believe that if Christians would hang on to this, it would change the way that we lived our lives outside of the four walls of a church. If you and I truly held on to the fact that we are being sent to be a missionary of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even if it's to our neighbor, you do not need to leave your country. You don't need to leave your town to be a missionary. You are a missionary. Every one of us claiming Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, we are missionaries in a good way or a bad way. He's with you. You hang on to that, don't worry about what they think, what they call you. Paul's going into Corinth. It doesn't get any tougher than that. Today, what? They might call us a mean name, make fun of us, fundamentalist hick. Get over that. Paul was going into a place where they would kill him. Uh, let me just kind of show you here. Corinth, very important place back in the day. Um, you see the little connection there? They, they carved out a, a tunnel, not a tunnel, but a canal through there so that they could move the boats through there. But the people that were on the boats, they'd go up into Corinth, which was right up in there, and they would spend the day while they were moving the boats through there. And it saved them a lot of time. Instead of having to go all the way around and up here to take the goods around, they could just go through there. All right? So here's where Paul was being sent to. Back in the day, it was something special. Today, it's really just a pile of rock. Let's just be honest, okay? But it's a pretty cool pile of rock. There's still some neat things going on there. And by the way, why do I deal with creation and evolution? Because that's my passion? No, my passion is the authority of the Word of God. All I want to deal with are the tools that the world uses to get people to doubt the Word of God. And you and I have got to admit that evolution is one of the tools that's being used. So that's why I deal with it. I'm walking into Corinth, buying my ticket, and this is the book that they're selling. A book teaching evolution in Corinth ruins? In Greece? Yes. Everywhere you go, you're going to see this message. So this is where Paul was headed, and I'm telling you, Paul did what he was told to do. And I can back it up with Scripture. You know why? Because take a look at what happens. When Gallio was pro of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. Why did they rise up against him? Because he did what he was told to do. Go speak. Do not be afraid. Do not keep silent. If he had gone and blended in, nothing would have been done to him. But the fact that he stood up and was a beacon, a lightning rod, they got wound up. So they take him to the judgment seat. Please don't just read the scripture superficially. You've got to get in and, and study the words. There's a great study Bible back there on the table next to me. Henry Morris's study Bible. Man, it's like an encyclopedia. I've got the old version. Mine's only like a quarter as thick as that one. But it's a great study Bible. You need to get into the word. And, and, and that word judgment seat, bima, oh, <laughs> Let me take you to the original Bema, because you've got to go to Athens to see it. And here's the Bema in Athens. It's a speaker's platform. It's not really big. It's about as high as this platform right here. And it's only about as big as these steps right here, okay? As, as far as width goes. This was the place that every Greek citizen had the right to get up on the Bema and to state their peace. But there were a couple of restrictions. Number one... If what you said on the bema didn't turn out to be true, you could be put to death. So you better know what you're talking about when you got up on the bema. Number two, when you got up and started speaking, they had a jar off to the side that they would fill with water and they had a spigot. And they pulled a little plug and the water would start dripping. And when the last drop dripped, you were done, brother. Don't care if you're in the middle of a sentence or not. You're done. You guys might ought to consider that next year. The water clock thing, boom, done. Then you don't have to come up and like pull me off. <laughs> The Bema wasn't like that in Corinth. Bema is totally different. Come take a look at the Bema in Corinth. It's a big platform. It like came up to my chin. And it was a big thing. It was like these uh, four, these right here. This would have been about the size of it. This four, but up, up to about this height. Why did it change? Because the Romans came into town. And when the Romans came into town, changed everything. Changed everything. It became a place of judgment. No longer let come let us reason together. It was a judgment place. Oh, by the way, by the way, I told you Corinth was a tough town. Do you see the mountain right there? Questions require responses. Can you see the mountain right there? Okay. Do you see those bumps on the top of that mountain? That is the remains of, to the temple of the goddess of love. Okay. 
This is where three to 5,000 female and male temple prostitutes came out every day, walked down into the city, got the worshipers to go back up into the temple to worship the goddess of love. You know what I'm talking about. This was a tough town, okay? And by the way, on the bottom of the shoes of the prostitutes, they had an arrow point in the direction that they were walking so that it would leave the footprints in the sand and it had a Greek character that said, follow me. Did somebody else say that? What did Jesus say? Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Do you understand in that little simple phrase, Christ was going after some of the nastiest stuff going on. You gotta dig deep into the scripture, man. There's nuggets in there. It's a gold mine, you just gotta dig for it. You cannot stand in front of this bema and turn 10 degrees and not see another temple to another God. You're standing there looking at it and you turn, there's a God, there's a God, there's a God, there's a God, there's a God. You can't, you can't not turn and see one every 10 degrees. This was a tough place. Paul did what he was told to do. Greeks got wound up. Bring them up to the bema, watch what happens. It gets interesting. This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law, and this is where it gets personal with me. Please don't think that I'm standing up here chucking stones at you. This is a very personal talk for me. This is one that I struggle with. So when I say what I'm saying up here, I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. Because you see, tomorrow night, I'm gonna get on an airplane, well, tomorrow afternoon. And my tendency is to put my headphones on with my phone and listen to my music and not talk to anybody. I am not an outgoing person. I'm not. What you see up here is not Carl Kirby. This is God saying, Carl, kicking me in the tail, making me do this. I am the guy that when I get off stage, I would disappear in a heartbeat. I'm just telling you right straight up front. I am not an outgoing person. And I am one of the most defensive people you will ever meet in your life. If there's something that you don't like about me, I've got a reason why I do it. And if I don't have one, I will make it up. I'm good at it. I got a lot of experience. Paul... He's innocent. They bring him up before the bema. He's going to watch. He's going to defend himself, right? That's what I would do. When Paul was about to open his mouth, this is Carl going to open his mouth. God shut it. He didn't say a word. Gallio said, get that stuff out of here. This is a loose paraphrase. This is the CJV, Carl James version, okay? Get that stuff out of here. Don't want to hear any of y'all's religious stuff. Get it out of here. Paul didn't say a word. You know how that hit me? Carl, the best person to defend your honor is the Lord. Somebody's making accusations against you. You got some folks in here tonight, I'm telling you, you got some sort of tiff going on with somebody sitting in your church and they've said something about you and you won't talk to him. You sit on that side of the aisle and you sit on that side of the aisle. You won't even look across the aisle. Get over it. We serve a God of reconciliation. The best person, they're making a false claim about you. You don't need to defend your honor. He will. Call me what you want. I know why I do what I do. I have gotten so comfortable with that. People can say what they want. I will listen, and I will, but I'm going to listen to the Lord first and foremost. He drove them away. I don't want to hear any of that stuff. And then watch what the Greeks do. They were so upset. They didn't get their pound of flesh. The Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, but Gallio didn't pay any attention. Remember I showed you the, the, the bema? Do you see that pillar right there? That pillar is the perfect distance for you to wrap your arms around. And on the back side of that pillar, there's a hole, and in that hole there used to be an iron ring where they tied your hands while they beat you. I told you this was a tough town. Go, speak, do not be afraid, do not keep silent. Remember a few years ago, 2012, everybody was freaking out, right? Right? The world's coming to an end because the Mayan calendar, the Mayan calendar ends in 2012. I got people in churches scared. The, the world, do you think this is when the world's gonna come to an end? Carl, do you think, why? Well, the Mayan calendar, do you know what I said? Yeah, I do. You do? Yeah, I do. I think this is the year that the world's going to come to an end. Really? Why? Not because of the Mayan calendar. 
Well, why the calendar end in 2012? Well, because that was the biggest rock that they found at the time and they could only fit that many years on it. If they'd found a bigger rock, they could have put some more years in it. Okay, got nothing to do with that. It's got everything to do with this. Every day in this on this planet, 154,889 people die every day and they spend eternity somewhere. The world is coming to an end. For in the hour that I get to speak with you, that 6,454 people every hour are dying. You want to get real? Let's get real for a second. That's 108 people every minute. You want to get serious? There's not a person sitting in here that's guaranteed another breath. Every second, two people are dying to spend an eternity somewhere. The world is coming to an end. That's not the question. The question is, are you ready for it? And if you're ready for it, what are you doing to help the person that might be sitting next to you that is not ready for it, that lives next to you, that you don't even know their name? Carl, I'm not chucking stones at you. Here's the atheist we're going to learn from tonight. Penn Jillette. He is an atheist. Pretty popular guy. Very talented illusionist. Very talented. I love illusions. And they're good. They are very good. I mean, he's an ardent atheist. Uh, he's a spokesperson for uh, American Atheist. His license plate is doggone. No God. Spelled backwards intentionally. Last book that he, he's written numerous articles, but the last book that he wrote was God No. He's a spokesperson for the blasphemy challenge. Yes, there is such a thing on the internet where you can upload your denunciation of the Holy Spirit so that you can party in hell forever with Penn and the rest of the guys. And they will send you a free DVD for denouncing your faith in a video. You get the idea, he doesn't like us very much. A few years ago, he had a TV show on Showtime and I can't even tell you the title of the show because it was profanity. He did two episodes, one dealing with the Bible and one dealing with creationists. Carl, why would you watch it? I, look, I didn't watch the program, but I had a young man, teenage young man, that did watch the program, and he wrote me, he said, Mr. Kirby, Penn Jillette is just mocking and ridiculing, and how do I answer those questions, da, 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 da. So I got those two episodes, and I watched them. It was not pleasurable. Let me put it to you like that. Dude is foul mouth. he's nasty, I don't like him at all, listen to what he says about the Bible. That it's more fiction than fact. And there's a reason that it's a short clip. Because about every seventh word was profanity. He's not a nice guy. Especially on the TV program. I got to the point, I spent six months of my life, and this is the truth, I spent six months of my life taking every one of the arguments that he made in that, t in that TV show, and fleshed them out, and gave responses. I built a talk. I had answering skeptics, Pendulette. Six months, I told you I'm the king of defensive. I never have given that talk. I've never given it. Because right after I finished it, it was within a few weeks of me finishing that talk, my best friend at the time, who passed away five years ago, he sent me a link, just a blind link, didn't say anything, he said, Carl, you gotta watch this video. That's all he said and had a link. So I go to the link and I watched the video and it changed everything. I had gotten after six months, I had gotten to the point where I said, if I walk into an airport and I see this guy standing there, hey, the Bible says don't throw what is holy before swine, dude's a big pig, you want to roll around in the mud, roll around in the mud because I'm shaking the dust off my feet. And I was dead wrong. Is there going to come a time when we may have to shake the dust off of our feet? Yeah. Should it be our first inclination? How many times has Jesus forgiven us? You see, what I have found in my life, I would rather shake the dust off my feet than deal with the difficulties of reconciliation and working through issues. I grew up with the father of a professional wrestler, right? I've joked about that, but the reality is this. When you grow up in that type of a home where you are constantly moving, you never learn how to deal with issues. Because if the longest you live in one place is two years, you never have to work through issues because you're always going to be somewhere again. Then you go through the whole process and you become a chameleon and you, people don't know who you are. You just put on a fake face and that's the way that you live life. And that's who I was until I was 26 and the Holy Spirit slapped me upside the head. Sitting in church pews thinking I'm a Christian, dead in a doornail. You know sitting in church pews does not make you a Christian. You can sit in pews and be dead in a doornail. And I, I would be willing to say that more than half the people sitting in pews in my country are dead in a doornail.
Christ died for him as much as any one of us. And I'm shaking the dust off my feet. This video so convicted me. It convicted me. I don't like this guy. Listen to what he says about the Bible. It's fair to say that the Bible contains equal amounts of fact, history, and pizza. I don't like this guy. But Christ loves this guy enough to die for him while he's mocking and ridiculing and This is the video that cut me to the core. It's not fancy. It's just him doing a selfie video. And he talks about an experience. If you're a note taker, get your pen and paper ready because we're going to learn 10 things on evangelism from an atheist. And at the end of the show, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we, uh, we talk to folks and, you know, sign an occasional autograph and shake hands and so on. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the, um, what I call the hover position after I was old on big guy, probably about my age. Big guy. No, it was not me. And I am embarrassed to tell you it would not have been me because Carl had shaken the dust off of his feet. I'm holier than thou. Not this guy. And he walked over to me and he said, um, I was here last night at the show and uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. And I wanted, and he was very complimentary about my use of language and um, complimentary about, you know, honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff. No reason to go into it. He said nice stuff. All right, note takers, here we go. Evangelism 101, point number one on 10 things we can learn on evangelism from an atheist. Did you catch what he said? He said that man was there the night before. What does that mean? That man had to come back. He'd been there the night before, watched the program, and he made an effort to come back the next night. And I'm not asking you to raise your hands because mine's the first one going up. Please do not think I'm trying to embarrass you, ridicule you, make fun of you. Mine's the first hand to go up, okay? But how many of us have been in an op had an opportunity, guys laid it in our plate to open our mouth and share something with somebody and we clam up? No, no I'm not asking you to raise your hand because mine's the first one to go up, I'm telling you. So what do you do? Go back. You see, what keeps us from going back? Pride, ego, that's not God. That's Satan. Those are the tools that Satan keeps us to the point that we have 400,000 churches and we're invisible in the culture. That's Satan, okay? Go back. You know why? Because there's going to come a time when you will not be able to go back. And trust me, when that day comes and you didn't go back and you didn't open your mouth, you will not feel good. Maybe I see a number of mature folks in here. Maybe you're one of these mature folks that has been teaching Sunday school for 35 years and you're done. You've served your time. I'm done. It's time for somebody else to step up and take on and do it. We're done. Like it's a prison sentence? Seriously? You do 35 years and then you don't have to do anything anymore? You're done? No, you're never done. You're breathing. You're needed. Mature generation, there's a younger generation. I said this the other day and I'm saying it again. There's a younger generation that is begging for relationship. And the mature generation has the time many times to give that relationship. Knee to knee, eye to eye. You're needed. You think I don't need people pouring into me so that I can pour into others? You're not done. You've poured into people, guess what? Let's take a look at what the scripture says about this. Acts 15, 36, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. You have a responsibility if you've been somebody that's been pouring into people to see how they're doing. That's a requirement. You're never done. Point number two, he said nice stuff. He was complimentary. This is interesting to me. Yeah, you know, I tell young people all the time, you want to stand out in our culture? 
I, if you can't tell, I work with youth a lot. You want to stand out in our culture? You do not need purple hair. You don't need a mohawk. And you don't need to walk around half naked. That's what everybody does, OK? You want to stand out in this culture? Be kind. Be nice. Be polite. Blows people's minds. We have become such a crude and inconsiderate culture. Gentlemen, be gentlemen. Open the doors for ladies. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. You want to stand out? Oh, dude, you'll blow minds. You do that. And you don't do it for just some reason. You do it because it's the right thing to do. That's minimum. Proverbs 19.22. What is desirable in a man is his ability to knock people down when they get in his way. That's the way Carl was raised. Hey, you step in my way, I knock you down. You got what I want, I take it from you. That's not what God says, though. What is desirable in a man is his kindness. Oh, I don't like that. Doesn't matter what you like. That's what God said. Ephesians 4, 15. But speaking the truth, can I stop the verse right there, please? I wish I could just stop that verse right there because I love speaking the truth. Oh, when I get on my horse, I love speaking the truth. But the only problem is that when I'm speaking the truth, typically I'm not doing it the way that the rest of the verse says to do it. Speaking the truth, how? In love. Do we speak the truth? Absolutely we do. Do we lay it out straight? Absolutely we do. But we do it in love. Or else you're a clanging gong. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition. Um, I thought it said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? Or, uh, Psalms from the New, just part of the New Testament. Little book about this big, this thick, you know. I've played this clip in big churches, man, and people start chuckling. Penn Gillette is a goof. He's making fun of the Bible, and he doesn't even know that Psalms isn't in the New Testament. What a goof. You're making fun of something that you don't even know. Point number three, don't mock. Don't mock. Guess what? Maybe he misspoke. How many times do we misspeak every day? I guarantee I've done it today and we'll probably do it in this talk. And the worst part about what I do is many times it's recorded so they can play it back for me. Well, Carl, you said this. You're right. I'm a goof. I blew it, okay? You don't mock. Maybe he misspoke. Or, or maybe he doesn't even know the Psalms in, in the New Testament. Yes, but sir, they are going to give you a New Testament. Ah, stick with me, sir. Stick with me. Maybe, maybe he doesn't know that. He's not the enemy. He's the one that Christ died for. And I want you to imagine that Carl is going to speak the truth because he's on his high horse. He walks into the airport. He sees Mr. Penn and Carl approaches Mr. Penn. You, sir, are a goof. You're making fun of the Bible and you don't even know the Psalms and in the New Testament. You know what Mr. Penn could do? Exactly as this gentleman said. He could pull the Bible out that he was given. It's a pocket edition of the Bible, Gideon. It's about this big and this big and about this thick. And guess what it is? It is Psalms and the New Testament. Who's the goof now? Well, uh, uh, Psalms in the New Testament. Don't put yourself in a position to be the goof. Be kind. First Peter 2.12, having your conduct honorable among those that attend your church. Having your conduct honorable among those that like you and are nice to you and pat you on the back and tell you you're a good guy. No. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. The ones that will be mocking and ridiculing. That's who my conduct's supposed to be honorable among. Why? That when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. I'm shaking the dust off my feet. This man's walking up and giving him a Bible. You want to talk about a knife in the heart? I was convicted to the core. But it gets worse. He said, I wrote in the front of it. And I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of uh, 
proselytizing. Are you kidding me? Carl's shaking the dust off his feet, and this man's giving him a Bible, and he's proselytizing. Now for the younger generation. I have found a lot of young folks don't know what that means. It just means that he's going to tell them about Jesus. That's all it means. Somebody says they're proselytizing. They're telling somebody about, as a Christian, Jesus. And he did. I'll prove it to you. He talked to him about Jesus. All right? So point number four. That man was not intimidated. But Penn's a famous guy. He's a big star. He's got a big, quick tongue. He can cut you up and mock you and ridicule you and spit you out. That man wasn't intimidated. Walked up, gave him a Bible, said, I'm going to tell you about Jesus, and does. 1 John 4, 4, you, 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 you claim Christ, you. Our God, little children, have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Do you believe that? Do you really believe it? Then it will change the way that you live your life when you walk out of the four doors of a church. Now, I've spent six months of my life. This man doesn't like the Bible, doesn't respect it, mocks, ridicules, profanity. Don't worry, this is a safe presentation. I have closely edited this film. So he is going to explode on this guy. I can't wait. This is going to be serious fireworks. So hang on. It's about to get good. I mean, he said, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane. I'm not crazy. Here it goes. He's going to blow up. And he looked me right in the eye. Here it goes. Did all of this. And uh, here it comes. Watch. It was really wonderful. <laughs> what? I'm looking for the fireworks, man. I'm looking for the profanity. The full four and a half to five minute video that he does on this one. He did not use profanity once. I spent six months of my life watching this guy on TV and every fifth, sixth word was profanity. Not in this video, not once. It was wonderful. Me, I'm shaking the dust off my feet. Point number five, did you catch this? He looked me right in the eye. Younger generation, hear me. I don't understand it. I can't explain it to you, but I know this. There's a power right here. There's a power looking somebody in the eye. I don't know what it is. I, I, I really can't explain I honestly can't explain it. The power is not down here. You want to impact the world? It's going to be here, looking people in the eye. Maybe, maybe because uh, Second Corinthians, I mean, maybe great is my boldness of speech. When you're bold, you're, you're up and you're looking out at people. You see, I can, st I can stand up here and say the things that I'm saying to you, not because I'm, ta I'm not talking about me. When I'm talking about God, oh, I can be bold, man. When I talk about me, oh, trust me, there's not a lot of boldness here because I know where I come from. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. I'm sorry. I have to take exception with that last line. I'm exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. I do not see a church in my country, for the most part, that is joyful in tribulation. I see a church that is a mess. I see churches that are fighting with each other and fighting within the church. Oh, you want red carpet. You want blue carpet, heretic. I can't talk to you because you want them and like them and they want blue carpet. And so I can't talk to you. Are you kidding me? People are dying and going to hell and I'm going to fight you over carpet color. Put pink carpet in here for all I care about. Just preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're f I don't see joy and tribulation. I see whining and excess. Come with me to the Philippines. Man, when I go to the Philippines, people got nothing. Come with me to Tanzania next year. They got nothing. And I'm going to fight you about whether we have chairs or a pew. Church. You don't think this man was impacted? Look at him. You don't think he's thinking? Look at him. But he was not uh, defensive. And he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and 
talk to me, and then gave me this Bible. Did you catch how many times he used that simple phrase, he looked me in the eye? Did you catch, did you catch that? Three times. There is a power here. I don't know what it is. I can't explain it, but there's a power there. Maybe it's Romans 1, 16, you're not ashamed of the gospel. Because when you're not ashamed, you're looking up. But when you're ashamed, your head's going down. Maybe it's that. I don't know. Point number six, he wasn't defensive, Carl. I don't like this one. 2 Timothy 2.24. This is the thing that helps me with my defensiveness. And a servant of the Lord. You see, I got I to gotta, I gotta understand my proper place before God. We don't like this terminology, servant, master, sorry. That's who he is. He is our master. We are his servant. But you know the crazy thing about it is, while I, my rightful place before God is on my face before him, he loves me, you, so much. He walks up, he picks us up off the floor and gives us the right to walk with him as his child. Nothing that I did to deserve that. I got to understand who I am before him. It's what he has done that gives me that right. I'm a servant of the Lord. So I must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. Oh, that is not a gift of mine. Doesn't matter if it's a gift. It's a command from God to do it. So get over yourself. Seven, he spoke to him and not at him. Did you catch that? You know there's a big difference. Because what I'm doing right now is speaking at you. This is speaking at people. I've been doing this for a while now. So this is easy. Do you know what I don't like? Tomorrow, when I get on the airplane and sit next to somebody that I don't know, because it's going to be one of these back and forth, and I don't like that. Maybe Philippians 127, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Conduct worthy of the gospel. You're going to treat people like people. You're not going to treat them like some, an ATM, something that you use to get what you want. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like to show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. I'm shaking the dust off my feet. This guy's giving him a Bible with five phone numbers. Are you kidding me? I can't give you one phone number because the way that I call is call home or push one and hold it. Phone numbers? I don't know phone numbers. This guy gives him five phone numbers? Number eight, he was kind, he was nice, he was sane, and he cared. You wanna stand out in our culture, you don't need mohawks. Be kind, be nice, be sane, and care. Watch how Christians are depicted in television and movies. Crazies. We should be the most caring people of all. First Corinthians 13, four through eight, love is patient, love is kind, and it is not jealous. Love does not brag, it is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, and I don't, can I scratch this one? does not take into account a wrong suffered. Man, I was raised with, I don't get even, I get ahead. You step on my toe, I knock you down. That's not God. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Over the last five years of starting this ministry and, and starting from scratch, you know, from where I was to, I've learned something pretty interesting to me. Check your motivations. You know, you can do really good things. You can feed, you can clothe, you can do all these really good things, but why are you doing it? You want to go do a mission trip, why? And if you have selfish motivations, you have your crown this side of heaven, and it's not worth much. God cares as much about why we do as to what we do. 
It doesn't give us a permission to not do right things. We should do that, but out of the right heart. Should just be who we are, not like we're trying to pretend or be something that we're not. Check your motivations. I know there's no God. Hold up. Sorry, defensive Carl, can't let that go. Is that statement true? You know it's not true. Biblically, God has told us that every person on this planet knows there's a God. God told us that. And I can prove it to you that he knows there's a God because listen to this next clip. Listen carefully. And one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Living their life how? Even the atheist knows there's a right and there's a wrong. Everybody knows. You see, the atheist, agnostic, most of the time they want the Christian morality for the most part, but they don't want the Christian God. And here's the problem. You can't have my morality without my God, and I'm going to call you on it every time. I'm going to call you on it. You want my morality? You can't have my morality without my God. Because if we don't have my God, then guess what? Here's my morality. People like you are dangerous. I'm going to take you out back, and you're going in the dirt, brother. Hey, you want my morality? You've got to have my God. How about this? How about two polite people living their life right? How about three? What about if every Christian this man ever met was kind and nice and sane and cared? Do you think that might have an impact on the culture at large? Point number nine, body of Christ, we have got to become more visible in the culture. No more hiding in our four walls, in our home church, or wherever you choose to worship. If what you are learning in your four walls or in your home church is not taking it outside of those walls with you, if, it, if you're not taking something out, of this, something out of this place with you, you have wasted two long days. If it's not making its way outside these doors, it's worthless. We've got to become more visible. Matthew 5, think about it. You, 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 you. You're the light. And you don't put a light on and put a bushel over it. We should be shining. And the darker it gets, my friend, the brighter we should shine. There should be no blending in where we are right now and where we are headed. Let me put it like this. If you're able to Monday through Saturday become an undercover Christian and blend in and nobody can pick you out of a lineup, do you truly know the Holy Spirit? Do you truly know Jesus Christ? Is he indwelling you? Because if he is, it's like eating garlic, man. When I eat garlic, I love garlic, but you don't like it that I like garlic. Because when I eat garlic, I stink. You get around me, I stink. I can drink Listerine, I can brush my teeth 20 times, I still stink. You can't hide it. If you can hide the Holy Spirit, it should be like garlic, brother. Oozing out of us, you can't let it, it's just there. And if you can hide it, you may not have it. Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, claiming Jesus, he's saying this to us, saying God speaking, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. John 20, 21, Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the Father has sent me, I send you, 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 every one of us. And James 1, 22, you know this verse, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. But I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. I agree with him. Religion has done a lot of bad stuff. And I'm not here to talk to you about religion. Christianity is not just religion. Yes, there's a religious component to it. Can't take that away. But it's also about a personal relationship with the living God who indwells us and changes us and works and lives through us. And by the way, do you know, have you ever heard this claim, more people have been killed in the name of religion than anything else? Have you, have you ever heard that? Do you know which religion has done the most killing? Take every war connected, associated with Christianity. Take every one of them. Add them up. 
I'm talking about the Crusades, you name it. Christians suppose it, but you know you can say Jesus and wear a cross and still not know Jesus. You know that, okay? But let's just say for the sake of argument, every one of the so-called religious wars that had Christians involved, the Christians caused it. Take every one of those deaths. Not one is acceptable, but let's take them for a moment. Add them all up. Compare it with Mao Zedong, Lenin, Stalin. You know what you're going to find? Every one of the quote-unquote Christian wars doubled will not reach a single Lenin, Stalin, Mao. More people have been killed in the name of atheism than any religion. Go study the numbers. I have. Atheism is a religion. Point number 10. That guy failed. Pen didn't ch change. He wasted a good Gideon Bible on that guy. No way. No way. That was amazing ministry. You know why? Because that's not our job to convict or convert. Let me give you this piece, man. This took all the pressure off me. Because I'm like a air tra I was an air traffic controller for 24 and a half years, right? I was very, look, I got to, man, I got I to land this many airplanes an hour or I'm not living up to the quota. And, you know, I was, so now here I'm a Christian. Man, if I don't get this many notches on my belt by the end of the week, I'm not doing anything. Uh-uh. Not my job to convict or convert. That's the Holy Spirit's job. My job, your job, is to converse. Are we talking about what we say we know and what we say we love? The Holy Spirit will do the convicting and converting. We just do what we're called to do, which is give an answer for the reason for the hope that lies within us, and we do it with meekness and fear. That's what God tells you and I to do. That's not Carl telling you to do that. That's God telling us to do that. So, Carl, when you get on that airplane tomorrow, I don't care what you like, I don't care what you feel like, keep the headphones in the backpack and talk to this person. I catch myself hoping that they get on the plane with the earphones. I'm being honest. I catch myself hoping that way I don't have to put the headphones on. Oh, they got theirs on so I can put mine on. Yes! I don't like talking to people I don't know. Why do we need to take this call into being a missionary seriously? If I were to say what I'm going to let this atheist say to you right now, you would tell me that I'm just trying to manipulate you and I'm trying to get you to buy a DVD. I'm not. My stuff is all donation anyway. You can't afford it? I want you to take it. I mean that. I mean that. You can't afford it? If you will use it, if you will read it, if you will watch it, if you will share it, take it. I don't want to carry it back with me tomorrow. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I want you to hear from this guy, though, why you and I better get serious about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. This is an atheist. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? That's an atheist. He goes on to say, look, there comes a point where I see you and you're walking toward the highway and a truck is barreling down on you. I quit talking to you and I tackle you. How much more important is this? Man, this was a knife in my heart. How many in here, and I'm not asking you to raise your hand, how many in here can tell me the name of the last three people that you shared your faith with that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ in the last week, the last month, the last year? And if you can't answer that, change tonight. Walking out of here, talk to somebody. No more accepting sitting in pews on Sunday and disappearing Monday through Saturday. No more getting on airplanes and not talking to people, Carl. No more sitting in the airports with all these people around you and not talking to people, Carl. Not chucking stones at you. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ to the will of God and saw Sonny's our brother. Did you just catch something there?
catch something there? Who was Sosthenes? Remember in Acts? Who was Sosthenes? He was the prosecutor. It was his job to get Paul prosecuted. He didn't do his job, so the Greeks took him and beat him. How do you go from being a prosecutor, persecutor, to a brother? May I go into speculation mode here, please? Because I can't find any scripture text on this. So I'm going to ask you to hold me accountable. You tell me if I'm trying to manipulate or if what I say is plausible. Okay? You ready? Wake up. We're almost done. Five minutes. Do you think that when Paul was standing up big and tall in front of the Bema, do you think there was a crowd standing around watching what was going on? Am I manipulating or is that plausible? That's plausible. Plausible. Do you think that that crowd had some Christians in it? People that believed. What do you think? Yes. Plausible? I'm not manipulating. How do you think those Christians responded when Paul opens his mouth, doesn't say a word. Gallio says, get that stuff out of here. Not listen to y'all's religious stuff. And the Greeks get so wound up, they get the prosecutor, they bring him and they beat him. Can you see the Christians? Did you see that? Paul didn't say a word. And they got the prosecutor. They beat him. Yeah, mess with us. <laughs> High five. Ooh. Moonwalk. Woo. 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 What do you think? They didn't know the moonwalk back then, so I know they didn't do that. How about this? Speculation mode. What do you think Paul did? Paul sees the prosecutor, whose job it was to get him punished, take a beating. And we're not talking about a whooping. We're talking about a beating. You think Paul maybe came up to a man who was hurt? Maybe helped him up? Maybe helped with some of the wounds? Maybe took him in? You think some of the Christians might have come around him, maybe helped him, fed him? I don't know. I can't give you a verse on that, but I can tell you this. You do not see a brother come from being a prosecutor through mocking and ridiculing and condescension and all the stuff that I see going on. When we get people who are non-Christians from mocking and ridiculing us and we return favor with favor, Carl, when I feel the hair in the back of my neck go up, I'm done. I'm no good anymore. I'm no longer in the spirit realm. I'm in the flesh. Go home, Carl. My conduct is supposed to be honorable among those that don't like, who mock, who ridicule, who are. That's a reminder to me. And maybe you can take something from me that I struggle with and maybe apply it to your life too. Lord, I just lift it up to you. You know my heart. This is a hard talk for me to give. I don't like the video game because I don't like that, but this is a hard one because this is so personal. <sighs> Lord, help me to live what I preach. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be the guy that is the hearer, not the doer. So change me first and foremost. For the folks that are here, God, I lift them up to you. Every one of us in here have our own struggles. We have our own weaknesses. We have our flesh. Lord, we give it to you. Be glorified through us. Don't let us get overwhelmed with the darkness that we see in the world. The light is greater than the darkness. Help us to believe that, to hang on to it, and to live it. Even tonight, put someone in our path that we can share the love of Christ with, Lord. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.